Here's a somewhat shocking statistic. In our recent ThinkLab Hackathon survey, 70% of survey participants said that today, they believe they can be served by a remote team of people from a brand as well as they can from a local rep. And that number was even higher as we looked at Gen Z. Now, let me be clear. This does not mean that the local rep is less important. We know that a great local rep has long been the difference between preference and distaste for a brand. However, it does mean that there are opportunities for innovative brands to step up, especially in the face of increasing pressure to respond with the right information faster. The number 24 sticks in my head, almost from the old television show. It's like, you've got 24 hours, please try to stick to that if you can. We have all these levels of communication between texts and Zooms or emails and phone calls and you name it, figure out a way to stay in touch with us. Doing it right means that they not only back up their product, but they support that open communication and that constant communication is so key. The voices you just heard are from two residential designers, Mark Woodman and Andrea Goldman. We'll hear more from them in chapter two about how the best brands are making them loyal superfans, especially amidst this residential boom we felt and ongoing supply chain challenges. Simply put, today it takes more time to serve the same number of clients for many reps. So to explore this topic, we took our typical Think Lab approach of looking beyond our industry for inspiration. The vision of Zappos as a service company that just happens to sell XYZ. That was the mindset and the culture that was driven throughout the organization, not just at the call center, the customer service, rep level, but throughout every level of the organization. It was much more of service first and then whatever else we choose to sell on the website that comes along with it, but service first and foremost. That was Stacy Wagner from Zappos, a company known for loyal brand superfans. In chapter one, we'll explore inspiration from the Zappos model. He'll challenge us all to apply this B2C thinking to our B2B world. Think about the process of interacting with our brand over the product we sell, and he'll share four key insights as to where to start if it's loyalty we seek. Welcome to season four of Design Nerds Anonymous, the podcast that sparks curiosity at the intersection of business and design. I'm your host, Amanda Schneider, founder and president at ThinkLab, the research division of Sandow Design Group. So let's dive into chapter one. Here's our first interviewee. My name is Stacy Wagner. I'm the Chief Experience Officer for Zappos. I have been in multitude of different capacities from supply chain to our customer service and loyalty teams, as well as a few other components on the retail side of the business. Zappos continues to turn heads with its disruptively entrepreneurial spirit, radically innovative employees, and most importantly, the incredible loyalty from their customers. Zappos continues to outlive the seemingly inevitable short lifespan of the average tech company. So how do they do it? There, there is no maximum time to be on a call. Um, our agents are very empowered to do whatever needs to be done, whatever steps need to be taken to ultimately help out that customer at that very moment of truth, ultimately trying to wow the customer whenever possible. This year alone, we've had a, a call that lasted, I believe it was just under 11 hours. That customer that was on the phone with one of our agents loved the interaction so much, was so wowed by that, she ended up applying to Zappos and now is now a Zappos employee. So like, it, it really came full circle. When you talk about the customer service mentality and really being customer centric and focused, like that, those are some examples of the proof really being there of doing what we say we're going to do. And one statistic we read suggests that it's harder to get a job at Zappos than it is to get into Harvard. This suggests that in addition to customer loyalty, there are other residual benefits to creating a great brand. But if the idea of an 11 hour phone call gets your stomach churning or inspires you to create a spreadsheet analysis that proves why it won't work, let's back up a minute to hear the vision that created it. 
the vision of Zappos is a service company that just happens to sell X, Y, Z. That was the mindset and the culture that was driven throughout the organization, not just at the call center, the customer service rep level, but throughout every level of the organization. It was much more of service first and then whatever else we choose to sell on the website that comes along with it, but service first and foremost. But what is the impact of these strategic decisions or of making these type of trade-offs? And how do you ultimately navigate that while staying true to our ethos of being a service company that just happens to sell whatever? So while you may not be ready to, as Zappo says, aim to inspire the world by showing it's possible to simultaneously deliver happiness to customers, employees, vendors, shareholders, and the community in a long-term sustainable way, as we look for inspiration into how to create loyal superfans for your brand, here are four pieces of advice from Stacy and Sappos. Number one, leverage technology to get people connected to people. As unsexy and low-tech as it may sound, Zappos believes that the telephone is one of the best branding devices out there. Everyone knows how to use it. You have the customer's undivided attention for 5 to 10 minutes. And if you get the interaction right, the customer remembers the experience for a very long time and may even tell his or her friends about it. That said, depending on what you're looking for and when, even the same person may have different interaction preferences from telephone to text to even a chat bot. When you think about how easy it is on the Zappos side to get a hold of a customer service rep to find the customer service number, I mean, it, it's plastered right there on the banner, right on the home page, and just about every other page that you go to on the website. So in terms of, of trying to track somebody down and try and get a hold of someone to provide some support or some help, Empowering to help has been vital to Zappos' success in the customer service arena. Now, after that, when it comes to additional technology, SMS text, uh, your chat bots, those sort of things, that's something that we rely heavily on as well. Quite frankly, that's going back to trying to wow the customer. Not every customer wants to get on the phone. If I'm multitasking, I have other things going on. If it's something that's a little bit more basic and not so time significant, maybe it's a text or maybe it's an email. For me, going a step further, the reason why it's so important that we capture so much data from the customer via those calls, texts, or emails is because we need to continue to innovate and do a better job on the front end to minimize the need for a contact in the first place. It's not to say that I want to make our call centers obsolete or that it's not important, but again, if you're truly continuing to try to raise the bar for your customers and wow even further, like getting it right the first time and making it as seamless and as easy as possible on that first go round is paramount. Number two, empower employees to help and personalize the interaction. While some may argue your company does this, how would your in-field sales reps rate the average customer service rep on field savviness? Does your average rep truly have empathy for what daily life is like for the average designer or distributor. Empowering to help and then no scripts, I think, go hand in hand and they're very vital. Ultimately, our folks are, the message is loud and clear. Take as long as you need. Go through the resources and the tools that you need to ultimately get the customer the answer and the solution and find however way you can help. No rushing, no trying to upsell anything, no trying to do anything other than solve that customer's question or problem or challenge to the best of your ability. So when I read Empower to Help and when I think through that and when I talk to some of our agents, it is, okay, what additional training is necessary? What additional tools in your toolkit are needed to ultimately better equip you to solve that that customer's issue as quickly as, as necessary? It's not lost on me just because we say there is no maximum time. Customer's time is still valuable. For me, empowering to help and really no scripts means tweak your approach to your customer. So if it is one of those customers that just needs something hard and fast, good. They have it at their fingertips. We've also trained our agents that if it's somebody that wants to chat a little bit further and the conversation evolves into a 11 hour conversation, you've got the tools in your toolkit and the ability and the empowerment to be able to do that also. Number three, focus first 
on the immediate solution for the customer, but second, aggregate learnings to get it right the next time faster. What's the root of the problem? How can we ultimately solve that and make this experience either better or make it right? How can we enhance it? What can we learn from it? That's another key component that I'd like to say that Zappos has been a lot more acutely aware of and focused in on over the last few years has been, what are we learning from those conversations? Like, what are some of the commonalities that take place from those calls? What's the data that we're consuming as a result of those calls? Not like personal information, but what are those common challenges that customers are calling in for? And then how do we put in some sort of tech solutions or some sort of other information, you know, at the time of purchase or on the website to ultimately make it even easier for customers? I will just call out a, a couple of things to, that we're thinking through that I would encourage most businesses to think about. I think it's a, a major opportunity across the board, like getting it right on the front end, like that is going to become increasingly important on minimizing for any additional touches whatsoever, right? Get it right the first time where the customer gets exactly what they're looking for, exactly what they were expecting, and we all move on. The price of returns, as we've seen for most companies, has skyrocketed with the price of transportation being extremely high, supply chain delays, gas, fuel prices, and just the market as it is now. You have so much e-commerce competition specifically that you have to compete for different suppliers to, to deliver your product, whether that's UPS or whether that's Amazon, FedEx, you know, USPS, whatever, like all of those supply chain constraints are much more expensive coming out of the pandemic than they were beforehand. And I don't anticipate seeing a whole lot of relief in the next several years. So between costs of returns and the sustainability aspect of additional packaging, additional carbon emissions, it's going to continue to be more and more and more important that you take the steps on the front end to get it right the first time to, to save yourself a lot of money and to save a lot of the sustainability efforts of the planet. And the fourth and final piece of advice is leverage data to personalize the experience and enhance that loyalty. As we heard in last week's episode, no designer has ever said, I have extra time. So I want to challenge our listeners to consider a world where your brand could save your clients time and literally be the easy button. Having those data points of what customers are really looking for helps us with our strategy when it comes to tech, when it comes to enhancements on the website, to different offerings to further get it right on the front end. For us within Zappo is more personalized experiences, knowing our customers to the level of we know you wear 11 and a half in New Balance, but you wear 10 and a half in Hoka. Here's the size chart that is much more specific to you and to your foot and to your uh, activities, right? Like, are you a runner or is this a casual walking type situation? Being very specific at the customer level to make it much more individualized as opposed to a one size fits all approach, I, I think is going to continue to be more and more important. Like, this isn't necessarily Zappos related, but if you're going to buy a new refrigerator or a new mattress or a new bed set or whatever, you can see it in a mock-up in a store, but you don't always visualize exactly how it's going to look in your bedroom or your living room or your kitchen or whatever until you get it in. So when you thought to think more about those virtual type try-ons or try-outs, if you will, like I think that's going to be more and more important for a lot of companies as we head into the future is having that technology to say, all right, like here's a mock-up of my living room, and here's what it would look like with this set of sofas or couches. So as we close out chapter one, I asked Stacy to challenge our industry to think differently. Here's what he said. And I would say, put your money where your mouth is, provide the service or the data or the info that is needed without playing games. I hate to say just do better. <laughs> like if your service or product or business model is really that good, it's not really that concerning to share information. I'll use Zappos. We do what we say we, we were going to do. We're a customer service company first and foremost. And so that means doing what we need to do to wow the customer at all costs. That doesn't mean that we aren't innovating in the background. That doesn't mean that we aren't trying to continue to increase or improve the offering in the background. We strive to do that much better in knowing that this is, these are the rules of the game. There's no curtain to pull back. You know what you're going to get. 
And then we try to increase our offerings and increase our product and our brand and improve continuously to where we can share without much risk and, and still go about doing business our way. As we apply these insights to the design industry, I want to invite you to listen in to chapter two, where we'll explore what creates loyalty for product brands with two residential designers in a mini roundtable discussion. You'll hear what they look for in a brand partner, new roles innovative brands are creating in response to recent disruptions, and of course, they'll challenge our product partners about what they need most today. Meet Mark and Andrea. I asked them each to introduce themselves along with one word about what creates loyalty for a brand for them. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Woodman. I'm an interior designer, color stylist, and trend forecaster in the Mid-Atlantic, just outside of Washington, DC. I've been in business for 35 years, which astounds me every single day. (laughs) And a word that brings instant loyalty to a brand is probably, I think, actually loyalty knowing that I'm loyal to them if they're loyal to me. So my name is Andrea Goldman. I am a a residential interior designer located just north of Chicago. We have a lot of projects in our own backyard and now we are also doing work throughout the country. We are what we would describe as a high-end luxury interior design firm that only does full scope projects. So our projects are typically two to three years long. It's many marriages with our clients and we kind of take it from construction all the way through to installation. My firm is only seven years old almost, but I've been in the business and other capacities. I was a real estate developer. I did design on my own for a while, but now I actually have a talented group of people behind me. We have our office and our immediate team that we rely on and we couldn't do it without them, but it really goes so beyond the walls of our office. We rely on our vendors really as an extended family member. And we know that the ones that are there for us when we need them or the ones that we keep going back to that they realize our success is their success. So I would say that it's that loyalty, but also consistency where you just know that you are going to not only have a high quality product that you can provide for your clients, but also the support you need to actually execute on these projects with that product. What have these brands that have your loyalty really done to deliver that consistency or to show that loyalty? I think for us, the consistency means that there is a quality to the product that is consistent, but we have a consistency as far as communication and who we are working with. There's a very clear understanding of your point person. And it's a consistency in how we all react together. This is an imperfect business. I think all businesses are imperfect, but I tend to feel that design and construction definitely has its fair share of challenges every day that are oftentimes not in our immediate control. And how you are proactive and react to those challenges, I think, really determine if you're successful, not just as a business, but also the kind of experience and product that you give a client. So it's nice to know that we have vendors out there, or people, brands that we are purchasing and installing where they have that same attitude about really standing behind it, taking care of you as someone who's purchasing it, but also that end game of how do you get there and working together to make certain that you react and handle things the same way. You've hit a brilliant point on that. I think the loyalty falls into that as well. Not only are they loyal to us in the design field and making sure we get what we need when we need it. I think the other part of it is how loyal they are to their own employees when the company's not treating their employees well, when the reps are a little disheartened. And that's something that kind of goes through and you feel that you go, this is a company that treats their people well. In turn, they treat their customers really well. How has these shifts over the last couple of years changed how you're interacting with the brands and namely with this human face-to-face rep conversation versus maybe more digital interaction versus maybe how you look for brands to self-serve? For us, going into the pandemic, we certainly already felt like we had a solid team of people that we relied on to to do our job well. These last couple of years, residential in particular, has the amount of work coming through the door. It's too much. And then you layer onto that the challenges that we've had to face with just production and freight and being able to even get the product installed. We were used to very turnkey installations of what we love to do and what we were known for. 
And now we are going back three, four times sometimes to finish up the project because we just can't wait for it all to finally come in. And that's even with planning and purchasing things a year out. And now things are getting pushed. We're seeing 15 months, 18 months, just crazy lead time. So we rely more than ever now on the communication that we have with our vendors and on us mitigating and coming up with creative ways to sometimes get around the challenges that we're currently facing and, and are still feeling. And I think that we're going to feel it now for at least another, at least a year. I don't see it necessarily going back to pre-pandemic times for a little bit yet. But as far as our vendors and them bringing new product to us, or used to have people in our office every week, we'd have a calendar, we'd schedule a couple of vendor visits at least twice a week where they were physically coming in and showing us new lines. And we're, like I said, we're housed outside of Chicago. And of course, that that face-to-face interaction has been more limited over the last couple of years. I hope this isn't the way forever. <laughs> we're already going to events and activities more than we have in the last couple of years, but we still love to go into that merchandise mart and walk the floors and walk into a showroom and really see the entire range of what's available. I hope more than anything that those showrooms don't start to close up because of maybe less movement these days. We have had the support though of those vendors within the mart. And I think that we are, we're just grateful that they're still there and that they're existing and we have a chance to go back. I do some commercial work. It's not expected to be quite so touchy feely personal. There's larger groups, there's usually more people in the decision process. When I'm working with residential clients, it feels very personal, very intimate. I know what toothpaste brands they use. You know what their contact lens solution is when you go to the bathrooms. So it's a very different relationship that we've been navigating the last couple of years to not feel that personal. Products that we're using in people's homes, we are actually affecting someone's life at the end of the day. And that effect is going to go on for years in their design space. So our responsibility is very different to that than someone who is going to a food vendor and trying to sell them a bag of chocolates. You know, there's, there's a different dynamic involved in the product at the end of the day, where it goes from one thing to a distributor to a shelf, as opposed to an emotional response to a client, to a, a workroom, to an installer, to the end result of someone actually living with it for the next five to 10 years. So I think our need to make sure all these things are working on is slightly different. It's a very personal experience, just designing someone's home. You really know the finer details in these human lives. And you're also trying to create something now that they're going to be living in every day, sharing with their family, creating memories. And it's there's a longevity to it. There's a, oftentimes a, a large financial component to it. You have all these things playing against each other or with each other. And certainly it is, we rely on and our team of people to understand that as much as it's not life or death, there is an urgency as well as a responsibility to a lot of managing. You're managing money and product and clients and your team members, and it's just a lot of management, but it, the people that you are doing that with, and if they have the same attitude and the same ability to, to really support you, it makes all the difference in the world. Have anything shifted for the positive that you hope stays? Are there ways that this new digital era could leave a lasting positive result or lasting positive residue in any way? I think there is a shift in the need for immediacy. People understand much better that things take a while. Everyone has been affected by supply chain issues no matter what they do, if it's at their local grocery store or getting their eyeglasses fixed, or certainly if we're waiting for furnishings and accessories, anything like that. Oddly, I think this has been a good lesson for people that yes, things take some time. High quality takes a little bit longer, making sure things are absolutely spot on there. There are a lot of people involved. It's not just a 30 minute makeover show, boom, it's all done. There's thought process and design and order and many players. I think and this has brought more of that to the forefront, that it's given a real life lesson. And I'm finding for the most part, people are very understanding. They get it now. They understand far better than they ever did before. The expectations are made more. Perhaps it's a way of saying expectations have become real as opposed to a TV show where, oh, we just do it all. And no one sees the 95 people in the background that actually make it happen. Because we are full scope and we are with clients for a long time, they get the evolution of this process and that we're not 
be able to just go in and read you a room overnight. But without question, I think that across the board, outside of even within the design world, people now understand that they have to take a step back and be a little more patient. Oftentimes the things worth waiting for takes a little bit extra time, like you said. I think that some of those silver linings that have come out of all of this nuttiness that we've all been dealing with. We are in a high touch, high handholding industry where we expect a lot of that interaction. And I think when we get to customs or really unique applications, that probably will always be the case. We're never going to be able to replace that. But I want to cue the both of you as we look at this topic of brand loyalty, maybe even that responsiveness factor. Are there any new tools that have emerged or new methodologies or ways that your brands that you're most loyal to have scaled that communication, maybe in terms of leveraging virtual tools, maybe in terms of customer service and how they're serving you that has helped you create or maintain a loyalty, even if it's not that local rep serving you. Within our own office, we have created a new role, an expediter procurement role, where there's someone that just really, that's their only gig in our office is to, once those orders are placed, they're just tracking and watching. And if there's issues coming up, they're getting on it right away. But we're finding our vendors are creating a similar role where if a salesperson takes an order, we now have a second point of contact that once that order is placed through our salesperson, that's our go-to person for just trying to get an update on something, making certain if there's an issue with a fabric coming in, it's flawed. We've got to get a, another, whatever it is, but there's an actual individual assigned to just troubleshooting and trying to keep things moving in the right direction. So we have brought that into our own office, like I said, as a role, and we're finding some of our vendors are doing the same. And now they're communicating. So these newly created positions, that's now, that's the point of contact at a certain point. And I don't see that even if the world starts to smooth out again, we'll never get rid of that position. We found it to be valuable for all of our stakes and, you know, in the office as far as productivity and being able to really honestly have a handle on a project from beginning to end and know where we're at with our product and with installation. A new position was born out of this crazy <laughs> pandemic and it's never going to go away. I love that. And I imagine that role is probably not someone that you see face to face, that they're probably more like what Mark was talking about by phone, Zoom, virtual. Is that correct? On the vendor side, yes, correct. The person in our office for sure is here with us, but absolutely. It's not someone that I foresee as probably ever really meeting in person, who knows, but definitely we have found it to be super invaluable for us. We hope it doesn't go away on the other end. It's certainly not going away in our office. Challenge our product partners. As you think about your loyalty, many of them desire to be more customer centric, but in this era where designers aren't in the office maybe as often, and even if it's just one day a week working from home, they're probably not servicing you exactly in the way that all of them did pre-pandemic. So if you had to throw down a gauntlet to help them kind of balance their digital tools, human interaction, and how they can gain your loyalty, Let's start with the vendors that we really do go back to over and really rely on. They're already doing what we really are looking for and need. I wish that was happening with everybody, <laughs> which doing it right means that they really, they not only back up their product, but they, they support our relationship. That open communication and that constant communication is so key. I would challenge anyone out there in this industry to really, that clear line of communication who is that, who is the right person to talk to when we have not just problems, but just in general, overall business transactions. That proactiveness is key for us. That really speaks volumes and it makes us feel not only confident in the company that we're doing business with, but certainly it also encourages us to continue to do business in an even a bigger way in the future. And I agree. And I think it comes right down to the number 24 sticks in my head, almost from the old television show. It's like, you've got 24 hours. Please try to stick to that if you can and let me know. I think one of the worst things is you leave a message and you don't hear anything for three days. And we have all these levels of communication between texts and Zooms or emails and phone calls and you name it. And that's the one that I would put down and say, figure out a way to stay in touch with us. And certainly when we ask and if we say, I really need this right away, I'm desperate for this information. Please don't let it languish. Um, and if you have to, let me know that's going to happen and then we're fine because we just need it as quickly as we can in some instances. 
And I think yeah. that's one of the hardest ones because they are torn in so many different directions by so many people. Andrea and I both know we are not the only design people they're talking to all day long and they've got other people they have to address. But working that out and it'd be nice if there was an app for that. Oh, don't even. <laughs> As we close out this episode, I want to emphasize that while you heard relationships still matter very loudly, we also hear that how you create, maintain, and build those relationships and that loyalty today looks a little different. A huge thank you to our season four sponsors, Mannington Commercial, The Mart, and Neocon. If you're fascinated by our research, I'd like to personally invite you to join our next hackathon kicking off December 2022. Did you know that by 2025, Gen Z will make up 27% of the workforce? So, whether you're a firm leader trying to attract, retain, and lead the next generation, or a product brand trying to connect with them, there will be incredible insights along the way in this research journey. Most importantly, if you're a Gen Zer, we'd love for you to make your voice heard. Simply go to info.thinklab.design backslash design hackathon to learn how you can participate. Design Nerds Anonymous is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Discover more shows from Surround at surroundpodcasts.com. This episode of Design Nerds Anonymous was produced and edited by Sandow Design Group. Special thanks to the podcast production team, Hannah Vitti, Wise Grisette, and Samantha Sager. <laughs>